But to put this, what I'm going to say tonight in context, you know, I was raised in Fort Worth, Texas. My parents were, were nominal Protestants. Uh, my mother dutifully took me to the local Presbyterian church. Uh, when I was 18 in high school, I was born again. I walked the aisle of a Southern Baptist church, and I became a Christian. And that was during my second year, excuse me, my third year at the University of Texas at Austin, a philosophy major. And it was, it's the year I became a Christian. And the next year I became president of the Baptist Student Union at the University of Texas. They, they tend to promote you quickly when you're a Baptist. They don't, they don't wait on a whole lot of formation, you know. And uh, within a few years after that, I was licensed as a Baptist minister in uh, Madison, New Jersey, where I, when I was at Princeton Theological Seminary, I started the Baptist Student Union at Princeton University, which is still going. And I started a, a, a young Southern Baptist chapel in Montville, New Jersey. And so I was, uh, that was my background, Texas, uh, philosophy, uh, evangelical conversion, uh, golfer, baseball player, and not, you know, middle class guy, no special private schools, no Catholic schools. And then I, uh, I went through this incredible 10-year experience, and I want to share you a few moments from that experience, talk a little bit about the role of beauty in conversion and spiritual life. The first part I want to read to you is called My Nun's Story. My Nun's Story. I've made an appointment for you to meet the Carmelite nuns, Erasmo said. Their convent is just down the street at the end on the right. They'll be expecting you at 10 tomorrow morning. Nuns, I thought, down the street? Are you going with me, I said. No, I have a meeting, but you'll be fine. Just ring the bell by the front door and someone will let you in. Well, Erasmo Leva was an old friend who for years had encouraged me toward the Catholic faith. We had been graduate school together at Emory. This was getting out of hand, I thought. Yes. I had made this trip to San Francisco to talk about Catholicism. I was interested. But talking to nuns all by myself in a convent? That seemed a bit extreme. Like throwing a five-year-old in the deep end of the pool to teach him how to swim. Are you sure you don't want to go with me? You'll be fine. I'll meet you afterwards at noon at mass on campus. What am I going to say to nuns, I thought. What do they do all the time, each day, all day, behind those walls? For a moment, I, I counted various excuses for not keeping that appointment. I could say, I don't think my level of interest in the faith merits an actual face-to-face -face meeting with nuns. Or, is it a good idea for a man who likes sex and a lot of sex to visit nuns who have no sex? I knew even at the time that they were lame excuses. But I couldn't find any real point in my visit to the nuns down the street beyond making my family that I was staying with happy. I guess that was going to be a good enough reason to get me through this awkward moment knocking on the door of a convent. Erasmo and I walked up the street together and crossed over to the side where the brown stone walls of the convent rose up to interrupt the line of row houses. The door was massive and looked like it hadn't been opened for years. He pointed the, to the bell chain and said, I'll see you around noon at the chapel. And he walked away without evincing any awareness of my desire not to do this. I stood in the corner for a few minutes it still wasn't 10 o'clock. I looked at cars passing the street, the man, the woman walking by, and felt a sudden burst of pride in being a young man on holiday in a great city with nothing to do but enjoy myself. Turning around to the convent door, I felt sorry for those nuns inside. They were shut off from this feeling of elation, of freedom and youth. 
I then realized why I should go inside and meet the nuns. They need visitors like me, I thought. They must be lonely for company. Someone who talks to them about the beauty of being out in the world. After all, they probably don't have a television, and I doubt that they read the newspaper and watch movies. Yes, this visit will be good for them, I thought. A visitor from the outside bringing them news from the world. I pulled the chain, now confident in my new role. As expected, it was a while before it opened. I was greeted not by a nun, by, by a Hispanic housemaid who pointed to a wooden chair to the right of the door as I entered in. Looking around, I saw nothing except the chair facing a wall and a doorway to the left through which the housemaid disappeared. I sat in the chair and looked at the wall, noticing it contained some kind of finely designed wooden windows, like the ticket windows of a Victorian opera house. I sat a while wondering if I should walk around and explore the room. But there was really nothing else to see except a few examples of Catholic kitsch on the walls. So I sat contented thinking of how I would entertain the sisters with stories about myself, particularly why I was in the city visiting my friend on a kind of religious quest. They would be eager hearing about that, I was sure. It would be a nice break from the routine of their day inside the walls of the convent. I began to hear something padding softly across the floor behind the wall in front of me. Then the window started to rattle and slid to the side. Suddenly there were two nuns' faces in front of me, an older one and a younger one. The younger introduced herself as the novice mistress, whatever that was. And the older, she explained, was the prioress of the convent. Now, being familiar with Gothic novels, I knew what that was. The prioress started to speak, but I was already taken aback. They didn't appear bored at all, or excited at the prospect of a few minutes with a young man from outside. They were beautiful, in fact, both of them. It was confusing. What was coming from behind the wall, through the window, felt more vibrant than the street corner I had stood upon a few minutes earlier. How could these nuns be so beautiful, so happy? Somewhere in the midst of our conversation, I blurted out this awkward question. They laughed. Their laugh reminded me of the way the good witch laughs in The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy whines that she'll never see Kansas again. The explanation made me suddenly jealous of their lives. Where I had previously seen only restrictions and these huge stone walls, I now saw the freedom of their simplicity. When they offered to pray for me, I knew I was getting a real gift. Something much more than the usual, our thoughts will be with you variety. When the window closed, I felt that someone had literally turned the lights off. And when I went back out into the street, it seemed to me a lot less glamorous than before. So these are nuns, I thought. There's no reason to avoid them, that's for sure. As I walked toward the chapel on campus, I kept seeing their faces framed by the black and white cloth of their habits. I wondered if they would be as beautiful if they were living in the world. Probably not, I decided. Too many worries, too much trouble. No one was at the chapel when I arrived. I stood around for a while, thinking what was the right thing to do before Mass and after visiting with nuns. I took the opportunity when no one was looking to dip my fingers in the holy water and make the sign of the cross over my head and chest. I had always wanted to try that, but it always seemed so spooky. I turned around to make sure no one was watching, and I caught the laugh in Erasmo's eyes and the slight smile on his mouth. It's a true story. 
I guess, and that, that's the end of the nun story, and I'm going to move on to a story called Starting with Sophocles. I guess I should not have been as surprised by my reaction to the nuns, a near visceral response to the presence of sanctity, because I had first started thinking about the Catholic Church during a lecture on Sophocles. The place was Princeton Theological Seminary. This was eight years earlier than the nun story, where I, a Southern Baptist minister to be, was in my second year of theological studies. My professor at the time was a Catholic priest, Father William F. Lynch, S.J. Father Lynch was the first Catholic priest I had ever met. Growing up Protestant in Fort Worth, first as a Presbyterian, later as a Baptist, I was never in the proximity of anything remotely Catholic. So that day I first sat in a classroom at Father Lynch and his collar was a strange one. As a Southern Baptist, I had received all the standard warnings about Catholics. They are idolaters. They worship Mary. They ignore the Bible. Since I had never met any Catholics and was never forced to deal with the tenets of their faith, I listened dutifully to what I was told, filing it away for later consideration. My decision to take a course at Princeton on religion and literature from a Catholic priest, however, meant I couldn't ignore Catholicism any longer. Lynch, it turns out, was a rather well-known Jesuit, although his accomplishments as I read them on paper, it meant little to me. He was the editor of the journal Thought, then published at Fordham University, and the author of books such as Christ as Apollo, Images of Faith, Christ and Prometheus, and The Images of Hope. Father Lynch, I would quickly realize, was equally conversant in theology, philosophy, psychology, and the arts, especially theater. But I knew almost nothing about his background when Lynch began his first lecture on Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. Like any dutiful undergraduate, I knew Oedipus Rex simply as a text to be read in translation from the ancient Greek. I assumed any religious meaning of the drama should be gleaned from the speeches of the characters. Lynch, however, did not pay much attention to the text. Instead, he talked about the play from a director's viewpoint about its action. Father Lynch, we discovered, had once directed a stage version of the play. When he examined the scene in which, in which Jocasta realizes she had married her own son Oedipus, Lynch was more interested in describing how he had lit the scene rather than dissecting or analyzing the lines themselves. Lynch explained that the central moment of the play unfolds through the speech of a messenger while Jocasta herself remained silent. He put all the light on her face and left the remainder of the stage in darkness, including the character speaking the lines that awaken her mind to the, her crime of incest. Believe it or not, that was the first moment of my fascination with the Catholic faith. I have often wondered why it had such an impact on me and why it caused me to become so curious about the church and Father Lynch. As a Baptist, I was a minister of the spoken word. The success or failure of Baptist worship is judged by the sermon. And as a confirmation, the number of those who walk the aisle in response. Baptist ministers will get around, you know, and talk about how they had, you know, four salvations and three rededications last Sunday. And, you know, anybody, any guest preacher who comes along, you know, it's all the number of people who, who walk the aisle. So it's no wonder that Baptists have such vitality in their preaching. No wonder why they continue to produce preachers who can hold you spellbound. Baptist evangelical preaching has produced arguably the only vital, distinctive legacy of public speaking in the United States. One only has to listen to the southern senators on the hill to appreciate the vein of facility they are tapping. 
say, Senator Byrd of West Virginia, for example. But Father Lynch, by the way, the child doesn't bother me in the least, in the least. So keep, no, don't, go, don't go away. But Father Lynch treated the words as secondary. Only the face of Jocasta really mattered. The truth she discovered in the voice of the messenger telling of the child he released from bound feet was registered in the horror on her face. Her face, her presence, carried the action of the play. In other words, what, what's being said must take a step back so something can be shown, can be present. Lynch's lecture for me was an introduction to the primacy of presence, a foreshadowing of what I would one day know as sacramentality and real presence. Father Lynch himself was a frail, small man. There was nothing exotic or theatrical about him. He commanded attention simply by the force of his intelligence. I took the chance of befriending him, which he seemed to welcome. When word came in the middle of the semester that an illness would keep him from delivering any further lectures, I called on him, I called him at the St. Ignatius of Loyola residence in Manhattan and asked if I could come by for a visit. I had no idea what kind of world I was stepping into. I was a 22-year-old Southern Baptist minister from Texas. As I, and I still, and I spoke with a big drawl in those days. And I wore a long trench coat with a cowboy hat all over New York City. <laughs> and boots. As I entered the residence a few days later, I had a very clear expectation that Father Lynch's room would be filled with the accoutrement of a man of learning in the arts. Paintings would be hung on the walls. Bookcases filled to overflowing would line the rooms. Music, of course, would be wafting up from a record player, probably a Haydn string quartet. I knocked on the door and I heard a voice telling me to enter. The living room was completely bare with the exception of a few chairs and a coffee table. And as I turned the corner into the bedroom, I was stunned. Father Lynch lay in bed, the only piece of furniture in the room except for a side table. Over his head was a crucifix, and in his hand was a copy of James Joyce's Ulysses. Nothing else was in sight. I don't remember much about the conversation. My mind was too busy trying to adjust to the simplicity of the man and the juxtaposition of his faith and his learning, the crucified Christ and James. How did a Southern Baptist from Texas take this in? It took a very long time, almost 10 years. And of course, the nuns in San Francisco helped me to make sense of it. I never saw Father Lynch again before he died, although I did talk to him on the phone when he agreed to write me a recommendation for graduate school in, yes, religion and literature. Same year I met, the same year I met Father Lynch, he published Images of Faith. The subject of Lynch's critique was Søren Kierkegaard, the greatest of all 19th century Protestant thinkers. He talked about the irony at the heart of Kierkegaard's faith. It was ironic because it was a faith always asserted against or in spite of evidence. Kierkegaard's faith thus is always in the negative or ironic posture of looking beyond or behind the appearances of things, on the assumption that what is seen by human eyes cannot help lead to faith in things unseen. Lynch wrote that Kierkegaard's faith, quote, does not see it hears the word of God, i.e. the preaching of the Southern Baptist evangelical tradition. It does not see, it only hears. It inserts this paradigm of hearing into its seeing, its imaging, its experiencing of the world. I did not realize at the time that this was the, precisely the insight I had received in the midst of this Sophoclean lecture. My image of faith had been changed at a pre-conscious level. My faith was learning to see as well as hear. My faith was beginning to acquire a body. Now some comments on beauty and conversion, and then I'll get back to a few more stories. You know, I gotta justify my, my, my stipend by you know, doing some theory here. I, I can't just spin out stories. 
The idea of conversion and beauty seem to exist on different levels of moral seriousness, at least in the minds of most people. To them, the experience of the beautiful seems too subjective or too dangerous to have redemptive significance. Catholic intellectuals of the first rank, such as Lynch, Jacques Maritain, and Hans Joris von Balthasar, have labored to keep beauty from being dismissed by generations of the Catholic fable, uh, faithful. Much like our evangelical brethren, devoted Catholics are continually tempted toward a de-aestheticized rationalism in order to defend the faith. What is rationalism? Rationalism is an approach to truth that recognizes only mental activity as a way of receiving and affirming the truths of human existence. Rationalism, in short, in short forgets the body. It short circuits the body. It asserts the primacy of self-conscious inference over the spontaneous intuitive reception of luminous presence. It recognizes argument and ignores vision. To be sure, there are good reasons for rationalism. Intuitive vision and aesthetic experience do not stand the test of public verification or in the scientific sense. But this does not mean that they cannot be part of a philosophical or theological understanding of personal conversion and how personal conversion leads us to a new understanding of life and its proper end. But rationalism would, if it could, limit philosophical and theological discourse solely to that which is verifiable and scientific. The genius of the philosopher Maritain and theologians von Balthasar and Lynch is that they hung on tightly to human experience, to what really happens to people. They clung to what we experience in our lifelong journey toward God. Humans don't just live in bodies, they are bodies. What does this obvious fact infer? It infers the centrality and the unavoidability of the aesthetic, the word derived from the Greek aesthesis, meaning sensual experience. But once again, in using the term aesthetic, we confront a pervasive problem of expectation. To speak of aesthetics for most people is to address matters of high culture, the opera, the great books, poetry, etc., the dance, the ballet. This is a fundamental era. The aesthetic, in its foundational sense, is simply the sensual doorway to all knowledge and the acquisition of all value. I will not belabor the role of sense data and epistemology, the activity of the human soul, as described by Aristotle and refined by Aquinas and numerous others. Even though ignorance of Aristotelian uh, psychology is indigenous to academics and philosophy in general, the typical college class in the history of philosophy jumps directly from Plato to Descartes, leaving students with the impression that the senses, the body, is not really necessary or need to be radically doubted in the acquisition of truth. No wonder so many young people remain in the thrall of a sensuous immediacy they were never permitted to think about or, or, or understand. The reason why a convert need not be ashamed of touting beauty, as I do, as his entryway into the faith, is because the journey must begin with the body. In fact, I am surprised by conversion stories that consist only of intellectual arguments and closely rendered interpretations of various texts it is my understanding of human love that persons require some stimulus exciting the will to act. Something must initially be seen, even an idea, in order for such intellectual exercises to begin. What causes desire, what motivates the will, is the sight of the beloved, something beautiful. In fact, Aquinas calls beauty a cognitive power, conforming to as a formal cause, whereas the will is an appetitive power operating according to final causality. And in other places he says that, that, the, that beauty and, and goodness are fundamentally the same thing but only differ conceptually. This is the classic relationship between the will and the intellect. The will being the running power, as Thomas Gilby called it, and the intellect being the catching power. Since we are not angels and do not receive the direct illumination of nature, of natures, 
We would be completely cut off from the world and ourselves without the senses. We would never love, much less think. Von Balthasar said in a famous passage from the first volume of Herlichkeit that those who purse their lips at the name of beauty will never pray. It was certainly true in my own case that these many encounters with beauty led to my ultimate conversion. All the hundreds of books that I read, the hours of music that I heard and sung, because I was in a scola, the conversations, the arguments, the disputes, the friends lost and gained, the years of uncertainty and doubt, all were grounded in particular moments of inarticulated vision. Very Wordsworthian. Even though, as you'll hear later, I wrote a dissertation contra Wordsworth. In the experience of beauty, there are three elements present. Most casual conversations about beauty fail to distinguish between them and confusion results. First, there is the object of beauty itself. Then there is the subject or viewer who sensually perceives the beautiful object. Finally, there is the relationship that is created between subject and object. The subject of aesthetic experience can be further subdivided into those who create ob objects of art, that is, artists, and those who experience them, experience them, that's us, the audience. Most of what I say about beauty in my conversion is confined to my experience of it. But I don't believe that this relegates me to a pure subjectivism. In the experience of beauty, we are responding to the perception of form in objects or actions. That form is attracted to the human mind because it displays order and clarity in the midst of complexity and of temporality and motion. In beauty, our minds glimpse the handiwork of another mind, or as Dorothy Sayers would put it, we observe the mind of the maker. The ecstatic experience that it is the heart of seeing the beautiful, that delicious moment of going outside oneself, is a response to the ecstasy of the creator, whether creation by a human or a divine artist. The creator moves outside of himself by making an object and present, presenting it for view, which conforms with his inner vision or intuition, and thus that beauty is, is presented to us from an intelligence for an intelligence to view and delight in. It's as if two ecstasies meet one another and form a continuous circle of ecstasy. It is often said in the tradition of St. Thomas in the Neoplatonists that beauty is one of the transcendental attributes of being. Beauty as a, beauty as a transcendental is never directly perceived any more than any other transcendental, whether unity or goodness or truth can be known immediately. However, the experience of finite beauty, for there to be an experience of finite beauty, it must undoubtedly be grounded in a transcendent beauty that belongs to all being. Transcendent beauty, like transcendent goodness, persists regardless of the destructive forces of ugliness or evil. Just as Satan himself retains the goodness of his being, as St. Thomas teaches, he also retains the beauty of his existence, which, of course, Milton made a lot of in Paradise Lost. To be trumps not to be. There is no such thing as transcendental ugliness. This, this explains why beauty has the power to convert. To say this may belabor the obvious to most people. We all know that beauty is used to sell any and all products. We all know that personal beauty is one of the greatest advantages in life in spite of its apparent disadvantages. We all know that beauty gets our attention, keeps it, and lifts our spirits and distracts us from the boredom of everyday life. So to ask why beauty converts is to raise a question that really lies at the heart of our everyday experience. We can all agree that beauty attracts our attention because beauty by definition is that which delights the sense. This, is, this in fact is the classic definition of beauty given by St. Thomas. Being delightful, beauty immediately becomes the object of appetite and will. That is, beauty appears to us under the form of the good as desirable. Herein, of course, lies the danger of beauty. Its experience leads us toward the possibility of embracing some new object of love. That object may be destructive to us or beneficial to us. 
But the point is, beauty opens us to something new. Or as, as Maritan once said in a, in a sh shortest sentence he ever wrote, beauty hurts. Now on my second date with my wife, I said that to her. I looked at her and I said, beauty hurts. She laughed at me. She still laughs at me when, she, when I think, we think about that. And I, that was the only thing. I said, how could you laugh at that? Beauty hurts. I'm looking at you and I'm saying, beauty hurts. How could you laugh at that? Well, if you knew my wife, you knew why she'd say that. Let it be said quite clearly that not all conversions are for the good, that beauty does not necessarily serve the angels. The moral meaning of beauty is intrinsically ambiguous, which is to say beauty can lead us to heaven or to hell. I think that in spite of this ambiguity, there is a strong impulse within the experience of beauty that is in line with Plato's teaching in the symposium. Any experience of beauty opens a wound that can only be healed by contact with a greater beauty, a greater good. In other words, aesthetic experience can be, from a moral perspective, self-correcting. This is not an argument I'm prepared to develop or even defend at length here. But I do think that the understanding of beauty as proposed by Aquinas and later Thomas puts the person who develops a genuine critical appreciation for the beautiful at, as, at an advantage in the search for ultimate reality. When Satan uses beauty to seduce us away from God, he is using that which belongs to God. He is disordering that which is fundamentally ordered to the creator. Therefore, it doesn't belong to him. To summarize, beauty converts because it attracts, it elicits desire, and it makes us yearn for unity with, it, with itself. Beauty converts us because in unifying ourselves with it, we become new beings. That is why we must always take care in what we choose to love. Or perhaps better to say what we are moved to love and what we find beautiful. Because what we love, what we find beautiful will change us over time. Given my perspective, you will understand if I say that bad taste is no little matter. Bad taste leads to affective union with things that can neither elevate us or benefit us nor add to our virtue. Bad taste, in fact, is a habit of clinging to what defiles, demeans, and diminishes us. Our entertainments, in short, are not trivial pursuits. This is why in the magazine I all, all, often come back to the subject of church music. Because I find that most church music and most parishes that I'm in and I travel a lot actually get in the way of, actively get in the way of worship, actively get in the way of prayer, actually elicit emotions and appeal to associations and traditions which are antithetical to what I understand the Catholic faith to be. It seems to me that any aesthetic of church music should try to uh, take in, you know, uh, keep in mind that the purpose of music in, in worship is not to create a warm and fuzzy fellowship, a kumbaya experience, a kind of you know, post-60s Beach Boys experience, but to actually lift the eye and ear up toward uh, God, the mother of God, and the experience of real presence. Uh, it should create aspiration. It shouldn't, it shouldn't pander to that which, is, uh, that which is easy, that which is common, uh, that which is uh, so, so much a common denom denominator that actually becomes background music. And uh, I would say that any of you who go to churches where the music is palestrina know how easy it is to pray how easy it is to uh, get on your knees in front of the real presence, and it just—it's—it's like—it's like you're on—it's like you're—you're you're helped, like a hand is actually reaching out and helping you uh, devote yourself to uh, the real meaning of the mass. I'd like to give you a few more examples, a few more stories of my of my own journey. Uh, having to do with 
a experience of finishing my dissertation in 1979 at Emory University and then going on to teach at a Baptist college called Mercer University in Atlanta beginning in 1980 and where I taught till 1989 before I went to Fordham University and actually taught, actually had an office in the same building where Father Lynch was a professor later on and actually published my first academic article in the very last issue of Thought Magazine. Uh, before it was, I guess I put it out of business. <laughs> um, I spoke earlier of Father Lynch and his view of Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard, as it turned out, became the subject of my doctoral dissertation in 1978 and 1979. I used Kierkegaard's critique of the aesthetic life to expose the limitations of early 19th century romanticism as we find it in particularly Wordsworth, who I was struggling with at the time, Coleridge, Novalis, Chateaubriand, Whitman, Emerson. My devotion to Kierkegaard became, as it were, my final struggle to defend my Protestant faith against the lure of beauty and all that beauty entails, as we've discussed, the body and pre the presence of God to our senses. You might say my dissertation was a success. I used Kierkegaard to slay the dragons of romantic excess, its indiscreet yearning, its impatient with suffering and finitude. I even enlisted Nietzsche and, and the Catholic poet Baudelaire in a Kierkegaardian guise to be allies in my polemic. But as I finished the dissertation, I knew something was wrong. I had noticed a common fallacy in all of these protagonists, Kierkegaard, Baudelaire, and Nietzsche, a failing that manifested itself in their attitudes toward women or should I say, woman. Woman, for each of them, stood as an obstacle in their work, their vocation. Their vocations as a poet, a philosopher, and a Christian, respectively. Baudelaire is, was disgusted when his white Venus, the beautiful Madame Sabatier, offered herself sexually to him after receiving in the mail some of the, most, some of the greatest love poems ever written in the French language, imagine. He was disgusted, would never speak to her again. Nietzsche, who said, when you go to a woman, take a whip, isolated himself from women after a, the painful rejection by Lou Andreas Salome who went for his best friend, and consistently wrote of women's bodies and his desire for them as an obstacle to his philosophizing as, and his overcoming of suffering and the, and the impulse to creating other worlds. Kierkegaard, famously arranged for his fiancée, Regina Olson, to break off her engagement to him so he would not inflict his melancholy suffering upon her or allow her domestic demands to create an obstacle to his heroic and isolated conception of being a Christian contra mundum. I concluded that the reason each of of these anti-romantics, as I called them, I concluded that all of these anti-romantics still suffered from the isolation of the romantic heroes, as in Byron, that they criticized. That they were playing out the dynamics of a problematic romantic age. How wrong I was. Or how out of touch with my own struggle with real presence with the maternity of Mary, the sacramentality of creation, the beauty of God. One day, as you might guess, kneeling before a picture of Mary, 
in the local Atlanta Catholic Church, much of this struggle was resolved. I came close to getting it right, though, in the dissertation when I pointed out that for each of them, woman represented the fear of the other, specifically the fear of the physical presence of the other. In other words, the physical world and its inhabitants, they viewed their vocations as fundamentally antagonistic, or in going back to Father Lynch's term, ironic. Where was one to go then if you were Kierkegaard, Baudelaire, and Nietzsche? If you couldn't go toward the other for happiness, for the, toward the other to be a poet, a philosopher, a Christian, where do you go? The only recourse is to go into the self. The self as the creative, overcoming, or believing source. Nietzsche's creativity, excuse me, Nietzsche's overcoming, Baudelaire's creativity, and Kierkegaard's believing. Each had to be done in spite of and against the other as represented by women. In each act, the self carries the burden of inventing meaning and happiness in an alien, fallen, an infected physical environment where the intended helpmate of man, the woman, is a primary impediment. Why? Because of her physicality. Now, how did I ever get out of this corner, this spiritual, intellectual corner? No kidding, folks. It was Aquinas. It sounds too good to be true, and I'm not making it up. In the winter of 1980, just a few months after I finished my dissertation, I was hired by the local Baptist college, Mercer University, Atlanta, to teach courses in their prison program. I taught the first quarter in the state penitentiary and in the federal penitentiary, where I taught history of classical music, ethics, religion, and 19th century English literature. And that's where I learned how to teach, and that's a whole other story, because those were, that was the greatest teaching experience I ever had. But in the spring quarter of that year, I started teaching at the college, and I took all the literature courses of a faculty member who went on sick leave. But I felt, again, that my dissertation had left me at an intellectual dead end. One day I came home early from class. It was spring, beautiful spring day. And in those days, I had free time. You remember that, John? <laughs> in those days, I wasn't working 24-7. I had time for leisure, contemplation, and reading. But I, I wanted something different. So I looked on my bookshelf. And I, picked, I saw a red volume of the first few questions of the Summa, the Doubleday Image, Thomas Gilby translation, that I had been assigned at Princeton Seminary, but you know what? I didn't read it. So I thought, you know, I, I had heard a lot about Aquinas, and he was, it sounded interesting. I'll just start reading this. So I put a chair in the backyard under a tree. In fact, I put it under my bird feeder. And I started to read the Summa from the very beginning. Now, of course, if you've ever read the Summa without anybody showing you how, you get it exactly the opposite of what, how Aquinas intended it, because it, the way the articles are laid out, you get all the positions he disagrees with at the beginning. And so as I started reading, I think this sounds, this sounds reverse of what I think he wants to say. And so I finally figured out that uh, these articles had a structure he began with the positions he was arguing against, and then he replied to them. And as I read through the questions on the simplicity and perfection of God, I realized that I was beginning to look at God and the world in a, in a wholly new way. Then I came to the question, is everything that exists good? 
Put that in the context of what I've told you about my struggles with being a Baptist minister and thinking that you know, everything has to be spoken. That the word is only the sound of, that comes to the ear, not what comes to the eye. Put that in the context of my struggle with the romantics, their passion, their uh, desire for union with the whole. And a whole other story I haven't even told you about my own personal guilt, my sense of sin, and, and some, some of my own melancholy depression. Um, not that that's all that unusual, but you know, we all go through that. And his answer begins to the question, is everything that exists good? Anything that exists is either God or created by God. Now, every creature of, of God is good, says St. Paul. And God himself is supremely good. So everything that exists is good. As I read that, I reread it. I thought to myself, here is the answer that I've been looking for. To the nagging question left over from my dissertation underlying the problem of the other and the retreat into myself. Here is a foundation of goodness I could trust because it was a goodness that did not belong to me or myself. I and everything else that was, that is, was caught up in the arms of God from the very fact that it existed that I existed and had life. With that single idea, Aquinas saved me from a preoccupation with myself, with sharing the burden of Baudelaire, Nietzsche, and Kierkegaard, of looking at, at the other as a burden, as an obstacle to my vocation to be uh, a teacher, or to be a philosopher, or my vocation as a Christian, or to marry and to share my life with a spouse. The new freedom I felt was real. I now knew that my choices were not poised on a tightrope over a void of human depravity, but rather sprang out of the inexhaustible reserve, inexhaustible reserve of God's own life. And the moment I was thinking about this, this really happened. The, a cardinal came and landed on the bird feeder. And I kept looking at this line. Everything that exists is good. I kept looking at that line. I was looking up, and the bird started to sing. And the bird started to sing that line. I swear to you. The bird started to sing, everything that exists is good. <laughs> and I just, you know what? I, I just thought, you know, I've got to become a Catholic. <laughs> that was it. I mean, I just thought, this is, I'm going to become a Catholic. <clears throat> and I just sat there in the chair, and it's funny, this chair belonged to my father and belonged to his father. It'll belong now to my son, Cyprian, our new adopted boy from Romania. But there was a moment of intuitive vision of the beauty of an idea answering years and questions that have been, been struggling with for years. A question that had been first raised in my mind by Father Lynch's lecture on Sophocles. And then only a year later, because I would go out and see the nuns the very next year, would be uh, deepened by that encounter with them. And I could tell you many more stories because what began with Father Lynch in 1972 did not end till 1982. And during that time I met people like Erasmo Leva, who you may know as a translator of Hans Urs von Balthasar. He translated the first volume of Herlet Kite. And I actually had something to do with him doing that. There's, that's another long story. Uh, with great, uh, with Louis Bouillet, who I, who I went to see on that same trip to San Francisco. And with Maritain, 
and with other neo-Thomists and with a variety of great Catholic composers, Mozart, Palestrina, Joachim, uh, Dupre, uh, Lassu, uh, great Catholic novelists like Waugh, like Julian Green, Graham Green, Sigrid Unset, um, Flannery O'Connor. Uh, and the book that I write will contain, hopefully, if I live to finish it, a chapter on all of these encounters. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that I, D.L. Hudson, convert to the Catholic faith once 20 years ago, underwent a series of extraordinary experiences that led him to convert. I would rather leave you with the impression that I have been blessed with a constant experience of conversion. One that began in a dramatic way, perhaps worthy of a public telling. But if any of us, whether converts or not, ever stop converting, then we have all fallen short of the vision we originally received.